اور بلّہ شیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الحمد للہ ربی حدان لہذا و ما کن لنحتدی رولا حدان اللہ الحمد للہ ربی انزل الفرقان على عبده لیکون للعالمین نذیر والصلاة والسلام على خیر خلق و نور عرش افضل الانبیاء والمرسلین حبیبنا و سیدنا و سندنا و شفیعنا و مولانا ابی القاسم محمد اللہم صلی اللہ وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I thank Him for giving us this existence, this realization, this venue, this blessed month. And I congratulate the human race for this great gift Allah has given us. The banquet, the one month banquet in a year upon which we will become much more cognizant, hopefully, in the real purpose of life, which is qurbatan illallah, to get closer to Allah and what better way than to make it a compendium of social systems where the entire population of the Muslim world is commanded by Allah that fast. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ We have enjoined fasting upon you as we did in your predecessors. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you achieve God consciousness, piety, taqwa. Taqwa is a very deep word. But here when we say it, قُرْبَةً إِلَى الله, it is the principle behind taqwa, that I want to get closer to Allah. So congratulations to the human race. Welcome Ramadan. We're most blessed to be here. And of course, I'm honored to be in this gathering with my respected Sheikh Ilahi and this wonderful audience in the month of Ramadan, that as we begin this blessed month, there's a lot to discuss, a lot to share, because in this month, it's not only fasting. Fasting actually helps us to do what inshallah will be struggling or trying to get to in these kinds of discussions because fasting actually enhances us and hopefully will make us more pliant, more cognizant, more introspective, more, you know, with cognition, cognitive, etc., etc., which I think is crucial because that's where shaitan works the most. He wants to make us a community of people who have, let's say, ghafil, one who's, who's got ghaflat, one who's reckless, careless, doesn't really care about the very function and purpose of life. And I hope that, inshallah, we achieve that in these 30 days of Ramadan. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al-Muhammad. So, of course, we're here in the month of Ramadan, and typically we always start with this verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahru Ramadan, and the preceding verses, Allah talks about fasting, that we have enjoined fasting upon you, and those who witness it should keep their fast. And of course, the whole concept behind this principle is that Allah keeps saying, so that you become more aware, so that you become better, so that you become more God conscious. So let's talk about that, because I think that's where the human race is moving away from. When we look at technology today, we're very impressed for, you know, we have We've made a tremendous amount of uh, leaps when it comes to technology. If we talk 15 years ago to what we have today in terms of where technology has reached. I mean, 15 years ago, we, we had half the things that we're using today. I mean, just chat GPT, to give an example, of, you know, artificial intelligence in itself is a mind blower. But to realize that that's a human creation, it's a concoction of the human being, and that we are able to tap into incredible abilities where we can process data at quantum levels soon. You know, we're right now at computer levels, we haven't really touched quantum computing. When computing gets to quantum level, it's gonna blow away all the systems we have today. All the passwords, the encryption states, 128-bit encryption is all junk because quantum levels will melt all of this. And we have the capacity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that we're capable of traversing incredible limitations that we have on Earth today, particularly 
uh, the limitations we have physically, but the potential of reaching the high levels of trajectories, like what Allah says, Subhanallah, Asra bi abdihi layla min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa alladhi barakna. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his servant to the furthest mosque, which was, of course, the mosque in paradise, Masjid al Aqsa is not only this one that's in Jerusalem, but also the furthest mosque in the heavens. And Allah describes it in the Quran that the Messenger of Allah not only reached the highest stations, but he reached a station that even angels are not allowed to enter. Kaaba Kalsani al Adna, the distance between two bows even nearer. That proximity, the physical proximity, is an expression of something that Allah allowed the Prophet to touch 14 centuries ago. Whereas at that time, you know, people didn't even use electricity, wasn't even discovered. How can the Messenger of Allah travel at quantum levels where he traveled, you know, faster than the speed of light? People say he traveled with, in Barak, just a quick footnote, that he actually got on a horse with wings. This is something that is being used metaphorically. Even Richard Dawkins, when he was questioning you know, Mahdi Hassan on, in Oxford, he brought that question forward. I want us to understand that history has a lot of metaphors. That doesn't mean it's physical, it's a metaphor. At that time, the fastest creature was a horse, and add wings on it, it becomes even faster. It's a metaphor. But Burak also means lightning bolt. The messenger traveled at the speed beyond the speed of light. In fact, the speed of light is a limitation in quantum physics. The speed of light is too slow in quantum physics. And the messenger went beyond that. And the reason I'm bringing this conversation forward is that the physical capabilities that we have as a human race has not even been tapped yet. Our trajectory in technology, very quick note, is, is growing asymptotically. It's growing very fast. Every, every year now, our techno technological breakthroughs are 10 times faster than they were 10 years ago. That means our trajectory is getting faster and faster. And there'll be things we'll be able to do that when we think of sci-fi and people traveling in space and people beaming themselves up, that was a fantasy. But now it's not a fantasy, it's a possibility. Traveling in space and landing on other planets is a, is a real possibility. We've already done it, we're doing it. We have rovers on Mars sending photographs to us as we speak today, and there's communication, planetary communication. But you notice that technology is growing much faster than human growth. So if you look at the chart, as time goes by, technology and the human growth is becoming wider. We're getting further away from each other. It's not converging. And the only logical answer, scientists have said, that will bridge this gap is artificial intelligence. Chat GPT is a good example. It actually connects the human growth with technology and kind of bridges it. It makes it one. And the reason I'm saying this is that that's the capability. Allah says, Alam taraw anna Allah sahara lakum ma fis samawati wa ma fil hub wa asbaha alaykum ni'amahu zahiratan wa batina wa min al-nasi man yujadiru fi Allahi bi ghayri ilmin wa la hudan wa la kitabi munir Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do you not see that we made the entire universe? Taraw anna Allah sakhara lakum. And here Allah uses plural, ni'amahu, graces, gifts, abilities, powers. And we humans are very much impressed with physical abilities. When somebody has big muscles, or somebody can break the world record in swimming or running or lifting, we're impressed. All physical entities, we get very impressed with. In fact, we pay big money to such people who are capable of, you know, twisting with the basketball and, you know, avoiding a few guards and putting a ball that's basically half the size of the basket. And they make millions of dollars. And then we worship them. And we put their pictures, big ones, to cover from ceiling to the floor. Like these are our gods because they can throw a ball. There's all physical matters. And that's wonderful. And I think that's great if a human being can do that. I think we should glorify Allah when we see these spectacular basketball players 
or soccer players kicking those balls while in the air with precision. We should glorify that. We should say, Subhanallah, Fatabarakallah, Ahsan al Khaliqin, blessed is he who is the best of makers. Look at that ability of two muscles, push and pull, working with the brain with such precision that there's a 3D effect in a human being that while he's kicking the ball, he knows exactly the distance of where that goal is. Even a camera, these cameras cannot do it. They don't have the ability of depth of perception. We have depth of perception. My eye has depth of perception. Just think about how much نعمه. How much we have given them. existence. Hearing, sight. A heart. This heart, not only the beating heart, but the heart that is me, my qalb, which is broken into so many aspects of sadr, shabaf, fitra, all these aspects that Allah has made me so incredibly complicated that I can have a conversation with myself about myself. That's mind-blowing when I'm the only person talking to myself. How can I be multiple persons? I'm not, I don't have multiple personalities. How can I be cognizant of who I am and I talk about myself to myself with myself? Allah says, Khalilan ma tashkurun. How ungrateful you are with what I've given you. So in light of this technology that we're very impressed with today, that ChatGPT can now suddenly create a phenomenal sentence that will just blow your mind, like, wow, I could have written this in 100 years. True. But is that an accomplishment? Is that what Allah is going to judge me on Judgment Day? That you wrote fantastic prose and poems and letters? Is that what Allah is going to judge me on? No. Is Allah going to judge me that I got 10 gold medals in the Olympics? No. Then what is Allah going to judge me on? My beauty? My size? My skin color? My height? My material acquisition? We all know in this audience without any hesitation that those are not going to be uh, we're not going to be subject to be questioned on those unless they have ethical manners meaning we will question you about the na'mah it will have ethical values so if you're born rich Allah is not going to question you why were you born rich Allah will say when you were born rich what did you do with the money did you abuse it or did you use it that's true. But at the end of the day, is it the physical matter? Will Allah give more grace to the rich and condemn the poor because they had less on earth? Can any one of us say that? The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. He says, Oh Allah, keep me among the poor. Let me die with the poor and raise me with the poor. Why is the Messenger of Allah, who is the best human being ever created, why is he asking to be among the poor? When they were abject, they had no possessions. We're all aspiring to possessions. There's nothing wrong to be possessive and to possess. It's not haram. Who made it haram for you? Allah says, go get your rizq. But is that going to be questioned? Is that what Allah is questioning me on Judgment Day? No. But if you examine the human race, we're all busy spending 95% of our allocated time on earth focusing on that. How can I get rich? How can my numbers get bigger? How can my muscles get bigger? How can I get more beautiful? Those are all essential. But why 95% of our resources? If you talk to teenagers, what is do you think they think about Akhirah, generally? No. Do they think about Salah? No, generally you have to remind them. Do they think of morals and ethics? No, you have to remind them. The older generation has had it. It's worn out. They ran after it. It got dull. They realized there's a lot more to acquisition than acquisition. That there's more to life than what I have accomplished. Go ask a very rich person who's very wise, who'll tell you all these millions that I have is nothing, stepping stool. I still haven't completed myself. So what is it that you need to complete? Shahrul Ramadan is precisely for that reason, to help me complete the parts 
that no chat GPT, no AI can accomplish. If you ask an artificial intelligence entity, it's programmed to think, to relate, and it uses multiple points of data simultaneously because of its ability, and therefore it's able to compute at a much higher level than the average human being's computational level. But you ask that so-called Borg creature, let's say it's a robot, are you thinking of the Day of Judgment? The robot will look at you and say, I'm not programmed for this. You ask actually Chad GPT, what, what do you think of the Day of Judgment? He says, I'm not programmed for that. They actually answer you that way. Why? There is no liability. There's no consciousness. There's no punitive danger. All you do is just unplug the thing. It's got no fear. It doesn't understand its own existential nature. Has mankind not considered they were not worthy of being mentioned? Allah says, I create in the halakana al insan min nutfatin amshajin nabdalihi, fajalnahu sami an bakira, in the hadeinahu sabila, in ma shakira, in ma kafura. This is very different from any material acquisition, from any computational power, from any supercomputer that can outwit calculation. We're not impressed with that. We're impressed with the sublime nature of a human being who's humble, who's wise, who can hold back their anger. And they forgive mankind. That ability, the moral foundation of insan, what Allah says, I created death and life. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا. هو العزيز الغفور. Allah says, I created death and life to test which of you is best in deeds. We don't we don't judge computers' deeds. We just make it better. We just give it more memory. We just give it faster computational abilities because we can, we know we're capable of doing it. And who knows, with quantum physics tomorrow, when we're able to tap into that, that we'll be able to do things that would be unthinkable. And Allah says, this is just the first level of Earth. We have adorned the lower heaven with the land. Allah says, you in the lower heaven, you don't even understand the dimensions that are potentially awaiting you when you leave this world. You're limited. Of course, the urafa, the ones who break the curtain and understand the dimensions of Allah, while alive, Allah gives them access to those dimensions. And they're able to use it partially, but even they don't use it much. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you, you and I, brothers and sisters, are spending too much time vying and fighting for trinkets and material things that have very little meaning and they become old and we leave them behind. Al-Malu wal Banun, Zinatul Hayat al-Dunya. Wal Baqiatu al-Salihat, Hayrun anda Rabbika Sawaban. Hayrun Amana. So, Malu wal Banun, Zina, beauty. Should we not be attracted to the beauty? Absolutely we should be. Why not? In fact, if we're, dis if we're not attracted to the beauty, we're rejecting the name of Allah. When we see something beautiful, we say, SubhanAllah, Tatabarakallah. When a child is born, say, SubhanAllah. You see a beautiful person, SubhanAllah. You see humanity, SubhanAllah. You see water, say, SubhanAllah. Allah says, thank it. Thank me. Wazkuruni azkurkum. Washkuruni. Wala jakfuruni. Remember me, I'll remember you. Be grateful and don't be ungrateful. So all of these are essential and we should train our children. But there's a limit. And this is where the possibility comes in, that I'm material and spiritual. What percentage of my humanity should I focus on? On the material or on the spiritual? Both need concentration. You cannot ignore your food intake, your health, your exercise, your good longevity, these are all essential. We must not ignore them. If we do ignore it, haram. But how much of it? To the point where I forget to pray, to the point where I'm not even thinking about the hereafter. 
for Allah says, Ya Ladina Amr Takullah, Wal Tanzur Ma Kajama Zirad. Oh mankind, be God conscious and beware of what you send tomorrow. Wala takunu ka ladina nasullah. Fa antawan fuzum. Ulaika humul fasakun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, beware of what you're sending tomorrow. Do we as a society spend time wondering what we're sending tomorrow? You know, a lot of motivational speakers and people who are very high energy will tell you, just think about the now. There are books written, you know, The Power of Now. Is now important? Very important. Extremely important. But how important it is relative to yesterday and tomorrow? Most people will tell you now, now is important. Living for now. Allah says, no, live for tomorrow. Innahu yarawnahu ba'idan wa narahu qariba. They think it's far. When Allah says, I'm warning you of that day, Ya ayyub nasu attaqu rabbakum wakshaw yawman la yajzi walidun an waladi wa la mawludun wa jazin an walidihi shay'a inna wa'adullahi haq. Be careful of that day. When you will be held accountable, where the father won't help the son, nor the son will help the father. And this is the truth, Quran says. Do we worry about that? Does AI worry about this? Does AI worry about its punitive damages? Does AI worry about entering paradise or hell? Does it even consider that into its consideration? No, it's not programmed for that. It doesn't have that liability. Because if it did, then you and I would have to adjudicate it. We have to be the ones to give it. We don't even know where we are going. How can we give it to, to a computer? We can reward a computer temporarily, but there's no longevity. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ النَّعِيمِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقِّ Those who do believe in Allah and do good will enter paradise, and Allah says, and they will remain in it, and this is a true promise. Can you and I promise anybody anything, including ourselves? No. Allah says, وَمَا سَدْلِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٍ Not self knows on what land they will die. Hmm? Allah says, can you? Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْرِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْرَحَامِ وَمَا سَدْلِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَى وَمَا سَدْلِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٍ No self knows what they will earn tomorrow, what deeds they will send tomorrow. No self knows on what land they will die. When will I die? Allah says, I've kept that a secret unless I deem it that you're capable of bearing that news. I will not tell you when you will die. And it's a blessing, by the way. Not knowing the moment of our death in general in life is, a, is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It makes me focus on my living. But Allah says, don't forget the death. The purpose of this conversation and the reason why Allah is so merciful to us, and I will describe it briefly, Imam Zain al-Abidin, Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. As you know, he has given us many gifts. Our imma have left us with gems of guidance. Unfortunately, we as a human race, especially those of us who follow Al-Bayt, just use them in mentioning their names, not in following their footsteps, unfortunately. That's a different conversation I'll have in these subsequent nights. But we, we recognize they left us with many gifts. Imam Zil Abidin, to me, the most profound gift that he left us was Sahih al Kamila. But to me, the gravity of this dua, book of what we call supplications, came post Karbala. Now, if you and I were victims where our own father, our own brothers, our own family was massacred by the human race for having rejected the call of an agent of God, Al Min Nasir in Yam Surana, and that human race ignored. I would be vindictive. I'd have a bad taste in my mouth for humanity. And I would want to disconnect from them and not have anything to do with them. Yet our blessed Imam spends more than three decades putting together a compilation of the most sublime words to, uh, to attract the very essence when Allah says, Ad'uni astajib lakum. Ask me, I will answer. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Imam Zin al-Abidin 
has given us du'as, many, on every situation. When I have problems, when things are good, when I'm sick, when I've got worries, when my life is under threat. Imam has given me the most beautiful, sacred words, and I know that whatever he said and wrote was from Allah. Because the agents of Allah, the prophets and the imams, they don't speak of their own words. Allah inspires them. And whatever they say is approved by Allah. And it's very bold when Allah says in the Quran that what the, what the prophet gives you, you take. What he forbids, you forbid. That's a bold statement for Allah to make in the Quran to enable a human being, two-legged created being, that level of human power where his jurisdiction of choices he makes is the choice of Allah. That's very bold in the Qur'an. Allah would never do that to an average human being. But Allah has given that authority to the Messenger of Allah. وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحِيْ يُوحَىٰ This Messenger of Allah does not speak of himself except that which is revealed to him. Imam al Abidin is telling me what I should say to God. It's like like you're going to the king or to the president and you want an expert to give you a set of sentences and words to use so that when you speak to this great person you're going to meet you speak it in the best of ways right, and most appropriate. What better than salah? What better than Quran? What better than dua given by the prophets and imams? So I will, in the end, briefly describe how imams in Labidin describes the month of Ramadan. But in a gist, the Messenger of Allah also, when he gave the sermon, the famous sermon, he spoke about Ramadan coming and said it's a banquet. Allah loves us so much. And this is one point I want to make. That, you know, when we look at the nature of physicality and spirituality, and Allah says, I created death and life to test which of you is best in deeds. And now you realize, okay, I'm under trial. And my choices that I make will ultimately decide my own destiny as to where I go. <inaudible> we have guided you to the right path, whether you are grateful or ungrateful. So Allah is telling me, the choice is yours. You will decide where you want to be now and in the hereafter. And under that condition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me, you are on your own. And then when I live on this earth and I realize there's so much disparity from truth, there's so much injustice, there's so much violation, so much lying, cheating. The world is ruled by despots. Today we have leaders on earth. The United Nations is a collection of criminals and thieves, majority of them. And not necessarily that they are, but it, just be, it morphs into that because power is so corrupted that the minute you have good intentions of joining leadership and then suddenly power comes in your hand and now you can be abusive and many of them unfortunately fall because shaitan is ever prevalently working on them so the world is so negative and now it's this fear oh my god i'm under trial and most of us by the way including non-muslims will say majority of the world is going to hell i remember dan barker said to me you know hell is going to be very populated but you when you go to paradise it's going to be very boring I looked at him, I said, why do you say that? He said, you know, us rejectors of God, we're all going to hell. I said, I'm glad you think that way, because at least you believe in hell. That's first step, very good. But what makes you so sure you're going to hell? Many atheists tell me, but I'm going to go to hell. I said, what makes you so sure you're going to hell? How did you damn yourself? How did you condemn? It, it's an irony at one point where you're rejecting God, you're even rejecting yourself. Are you damning yourself to hell? But that's not the case. The case is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed my existence when I had nothing to do with it. And he shaped me as a human being in a time and a period and on a planet that he shaped and formed in order for me to have the most amount of comfort. That he even made the sky blue and he made my genetics to love blue. So I try to make the sky red all the time. It's a very depressing thought. So there's some psychology of glial cells in my head that the minute I start seeing red, I start feeling sad. And Allah doesn't want me to be sad. He made the sky blue. And he adorned the nighttime with stars to shine and it's sparkling and it's magnificent. And then he also put a reflective substance called the moon to catch the light of the sun when the sun is not there. 
all of these factors put together for my comfort. We made it for you, subservient to you, as a gift and as a mercy. Do you think I've been created with the intention and the, and the necessity of just failing and slipping and going to hell? Do you think that is what Allah created me for? He created you for that? Absolutely not. That's why Shahru Ramadan, الذي أنزل في القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان هدى للناس. It's a guide for mankind, and it's a guide with a furqan. What's a furqan? A furqan. Quran's name is furqan. Ahl al-Bayt are furqan. Prophets are furqan. What does it mean? It means they take the complications out. They take the confusion out. They clarify. They validate. They show me the clear pathway. In the Quran, Yahdi Lilatiya Akwam, where you bashir Mu'min in Aladina, Yamaluna Salihat, Anna Lahunja Ajun Kari. Allah says this Quran guides you to that which is most upright. Therefore, give good news to the believers who follow it, for they will be rewarded handsomely. Meaning, Allah says this book is not just for reading, it is to be followed, but nonetheless, it's a book that was sent with difficulty. And we'll talk about this Quran. As the Quran was revealed in this month, and Imam Zillah Abidin described that. He said, Allah, not only did you choose one month out of the 12 months to make it special for you, your month, but you made it a banquet in this month. Look at us. We're not very social people. In our busy life, especially with technology today, we can't seem to be catching up. Did you notice, by the way, I'm sure when people were riding horses and camels, one month was one month, generally. Now, one month is a week. One week is a day. One day is an hour. One year is a month. Honestly, 2023, snap a finger, as my brother Mahdi mentioned. This month of Ramadan will vanish so quickly before you know it, we'll be looking for the moon to celebrate Eid. It'll vanish. Allah says, are you grabbing it? This month of reflection, grace, Rahma, Na'ma is upon you. Are you grabbing it? Many of us find reasons to complain. Ah, I can't have my coffee now. I can't smoke. You know, I can't do what I want to do. Okay, so it's a, it's a hindrance. It's holding me back from my normality in life. Allah says, normality? Ramadan should be normal. I'm just too kind to allow you to be on your own whimsical ways 11 months in a year. But thank God I grab all of you and put you under one prescription. And Allah is so merciful. People ask, why did Allah make fasting obligatory? For if he didn't, do you think you and I would fast? Probably not. How about to the fact that Allah says, if you break your fast willfully, you will pay 60 days consecutively after Ramadan for each one you break. 60 for each. Oh my God, it'll take me a lifetime to pay back. Yeah, so don't do it. But what if I can do it? Don't worry, Allah is merciful. He'll forgive you. If you can't, you're sick, you can't, no problem. But beware of punitive me measures. And Allah is merciful. But the mercy of Allah is also pegged in his construction and his restriction. And his wajibat and muharramat are also built within the premise of mercy. Abstention from food. I can't eat. People say, how do you do this? Like as if God is making me suffer for 15 hours, 14 hours, 12 hours. Some places, of course, less than that. Some places longer. But, oh, it's painful. Is it? I mean, every scientist will tell you any form of fasting in general is healthy for you. SubhanAllah, whatever the Quran is prescribed, including the food that Quran is spoken about by word and by name, every scientist will have a whole series of research to show you the benefits of it. Allah says, in the Quran, It's a guide. It's a good book. It has not misguided a single being. Yes. Is it a Quran? Yes. What does it do? It says, well, what we reveal in the Quran is a shifa, is your elixir, it is your attorney, it is your guidance, it is your representative. Shifa, wa rahma, and mercy. But Allah continues, it says, it does not increase for troublemakers, evildoers, 
anything but destruction. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا Khasara means loss. So the Quran is a book of Furqan, meaning it exposes the evil. It punishes the evil. It diffuses the evil. It turns off the fire of evil. Quran diffuses haram. It diffuses shaitan. It melts animosity. It removes bala. It removes any kind of problem. It's a shifa. So can we say therefore that when Allah has prescribed fasting upon me that this fasting is a punishment for me? No, it is not. And I know that we all believe in that. But deep down within our own thoughts, we should not have an iota of feeling of restriction in the Quran or in Islam because of this blessed month. Rather, we must see every restriction in the prescription in the month of Ramadan as a blessing and a mercy to improve my humanity at the spiritual level. That's why Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَسْتَقُونَ So you enhance your spirituality. For materially, you, the human race, are capable of doing it. One person asked me, Quran is 600 verses in science, about 600 verses pertaining to science, some sort of scientific matter Quran is addressing, although the Quran is 10 times larger, over 6,000 verses, but 600 verses roughly allude to some scientific observation. Alam taraw, have you not seen, right? We've created the skies without pillars that you can see. These are scientific conversations. أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَفْقًا فَرْتَقْنَاهُمَا Do the disbelievers not see the earth and sky was once one and we split it. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ We made all living things out of water. أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Do you still then not believe? Scientific terms. Somebody asked me, says, why is the Quran limited in its scientific terminology? Only 600 verses. Because we don't need scientific guidance from Allah. Allah has endowed the human mind the ability to empirically observe science and to strategically dissect it and come to conclusions because Allah has built a magnificent system of cause and effect and we as an intelligent race understand that system and therefore we can decipher and decode. So science is in the Quran, history is in the Quran, everything is in the Quran. La ratbin wa la Everything is in the Quran. But the point is, Allah says, it's not necessary. It's redundant for me to give you science. It's redundant for me to tell you the power of electricity. It's redundant for me to tell you the power of quantum physics. Or the Quran does allude to it. It says, you will figure this out yourself. But the biggest dilemma we as a human race have is the moral argument. Haq and batil. The ahkam al khamsa, wajib, haram, mustahab, makru, mubah. We cannot decipher that empirically in science. There is no science in the world that will show me what is halal and what is haram, what is good and what is evil. No physics on earth will teach me haq and batil, right and wrong, good and evil. Physics, biology, chemistry, mathematics are all empirical languages that lack moral values that can be added into moral values to make an argument and it does take us towards morality but we cannot independently use pure science to achieve the jurisdiction and the prescription of what is halal and haram in the principles of ijtihad where I can now struggle with my mind through scientific observation and come with the power of prayer to come with the rules of masa come with the rules of fasting come with the rules of marriage and divorce and prescriptions of uh, what we call leaving a will. None of these we're capable of deciphering them through any scientific observation. Allah says, if I did not guide you, وَالَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَ بِالْهُدَىٰ وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُلْهِرَوْ عَلَى الدِّينِ He sent prophets. In Surah Al-Jum'ah, Allah says, we sent messengers from among yourselves to teach you. وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ رَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينَ Before you were in darkness. Could you come out of darkness? No. You would know there is a God out there, but it's impossible to know halal and haram. So Allah, in this blessed month, 
gave me a prescription, guided me, taught myself. Hmm? There's ilham, fa'alhamaha, fujuraha, wa taqwa. He taught you and I wrong and right. So we have the principles. But how do you engage? But when Allah says, I'm testing you, I'm putting you through trials and tribulations, I'm going to make this final point. Know that when you understand human capacity, we function the best when we are stressed. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We made mankind in a state of trepidation. Now some of us don't like to hear that. Stress. I don't like that. Difficulty. I don't like that. I don't like being tested. I'm just going to end with this. Food for thought. When you and I live in extreme luxury, everything is done for us, and we have close to zero problems, you will find those people usually have the highest level of depression on earth. They're the ones living on the most amount of what we call prescription drugs. They have everything. They have a study, you'll notice you go to a poor country, people living on the street and working hard 23 hours a day or 20 hours a day or 15 hours a day, you go ask them, you have depression? Is it depression? If I get one plate of food on my, you know, in my mouth, Alhamdulillah, I'm happy. You don't have depression. You don't take any drugs. You don't have any pharmacists writing you like 12 prescriptions. He was looking, he said, I can't even afford a pharmacy. So why don't they have it? If you ever study two groups of youth, a 16-year-old child raised in a very affluent neighborhood, and a child raised in a very poor neighborhood who struggles every day, has to walk to school, maybe barefoot. Look at these two 15 and 16 year olds, and if I ask any human being on earth, who do you think of the two is more mature? Every human being will tell me is a poor one. Why not the rich one? He's going to the best school, he's got the butler, he's got all the technology, he's got all the toys, he's got information on his fingertips. Why is he not mature than that 16 year old who's poor walking on the street barefoot? This one may be more knowledgeable, but maturity, one who is grounded, who understands difficulty, the one who knows trials and tribulations are okay, and they bite the bullet and they swallow the problem. When Allah says, Trials, tribulations, losses, difficulty, threats. What kind of a merciful God is that? Allah says, I am so merciful that I created you in such a phenomenal way that your potential of even breaking quantum physics is within your reach and you will not get to it until I put you through stress. But you have to know how to manage it and you have to know that I created you and I didn't create you for a joke. I created you because I love you. And I shaped you because I love you. And I want you to be the most successful. Allah wants this in the Quran constantly. So in conclusion here, once I know that Allah is merciful and is putting all these trials and tribulations, and I don't see Ramadan as a hindrance, but I see it as a grace. And I see the negations of the haram, the muharramat, things we cannot do as a positive thing, thank God. Like when I was in the university, my roommate would drink, would smoke, would date, would indiscriminately have rampant, indecent sexual relations, they would say to me, why are you not doing that? What's different about you? Not that I'm an angel. Not that I'm better than they are. I said, I was warned. I was told about this danger. I have a system upon which I remind myself daily my options and my regulations. I'm not a wild beast that is hedonistic because it's glittering on the other side and I run towards it. But rather I've been told the dangers should I go towards it. And I've been warned about it. And I'm acutely aware of my punitive damages tomorrow after I'm done doing this beer bong with you. That's the difference. So Allah says, look at how much we've guided. Imam al I end with this. He says, and I'll just read it in English. But it's, it's so elegant. Where Imam al in the beginning, listen to what he says. And forgive me for taking a little, one few extra minutes, Sheikh. My apologies. Praise belongs to Allah who guided us to his praise 
and placed us among the people of praise, that we might be among the thankful for his beneficence, and that he might recompense us for that with the recompense of the good doer. This is the first verse of this dua, welcoming Ramadan. I'll recite it a few stanzas every night for you and I to understand the gravity. But look at the start of Haimam Zain al This Just this one paragraph I just read is like 100 hours of lectures. Imam Zain al is starting by acknowledging the gift of Allah in his own existence. And he's approaching Allah completely from a positive stance of seeing the glasses half full and saying, thank you for keeping it half so that I can fill it and I see its grace and you've chosen me. You've guided me. Alhamdulillah, you guided me. We have Ramadan. We're social people. We break fast. How often do we eat together as families and friends in the year? We're all busy. Technology has taken us away from our social. We hardly, we come at night, eat, pull from the refrigerator, or go to restaurants and eat very quickly. But the social implication of sitting with somebody and conversing with them eye to eye, meaningfully, with a stance of having some spirituality, in my opinion, is the solution to 95% of our social mental problems. This Ramadan. We sit and we eat together. And we plan the food together. Kids sit together. Ramadan is different. Thank God it's different. Thank God we have a system of social gatherings where we break bread together for 30 days, perfectly suited for the human race. 30 days, not three days, not five days, like some religions, not seven days, 30 days. Just enough to give you that jolt of energy to last till the following year. So Imam al Abidin is describing this. First and foremost, I recognize your gift. You have chosen me, you have guided me, and you've made me a person worthy of being mentioned. Now, do you think this is self-centered? Do you think this is egotistic? We need to talk about that. Because if that is where we're going, you and I are so wrong. Egotism, egoism are entities that take the negative side of our existence and conflate it to compare ourselves with Allah. Not that one. That Allah forbid. And Allah doesn't like put a bolster, you know? Allah, he doesn't like people to show off. Allah doesn't like it. But to say to Allah, you created me. You gave me these eyes. You gave me this ability. You chose me. You made me Muslim. You put salah five times a day. You made fasting obligatory on me. You made hajj obligatory on me. You made kindness and etc. etc. Kindness to my parents obligatory. Thank you. Thank you. You chose me. You chose me. That attitude is where we need to reach at, at a 24 by 7 level. This is when you tap taqwa, when you start getting closer to Allah, when you start seeing everything as a mercy and as a gift. But the first thing Abdul Abidin talks about is that, and then he says, Alhamdulillah, well, he says that praise belongs to Allah, who showed favor to us through his religion, singled us out for his creed, and directed us onto the road of his beneficence in order that through his kindness, we might travel upon his good pleasure. Meaning, Imam is saying, you have set the precedence. You have given me the guidance. How many people get angry when Allah gives us the rules and regulations, the wajibat? Oh, why did Allah do this? Imam Ali alayhi salam says in Najib al it is very odd how the human being complains about what Allah has forbidden from the very, from the plethora of things. Very few things are forbidden. Yet they zone in on the forbidden and they become very dejected and angry with God. When everything else that Allah has made halal, they don't look at that. You know who does that? Iblis, Shaitan, Shayateen, Kuffar, Rejected. وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلَّ خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ No one rejects the signs of Allah except one who is bent on rejecting. So I end tonight with this. That this month of Ramadan, is a month of gift, is a month of reflection, it's a month of plentitude. And while we're starting it, I advise us all, let's embrace it, let's be happy, and let's plan for the next 29 days. What am I going to do to maximize? And Imam Zain al mentions it. He says, of all these gifts you've chosen in this month for us, for us, you made it special for us, it's your month, but for us, that you chose it in it, 
one night, which is better than a thousand months. You chose it for us, oh Allah. And in that night, you forgive thousands of times. And in that night, my prayer is accepted infinitely greater. And in that night, you revealed the Quran. Wow! What a combination of guidance, salvation, reconnection. When Allah said, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Allah says, when my believers ask you about me, tell them I'm near. I'm near. I reply when they talk to me. Therefore, let them reply me and believe in me so that they are guided. This last part, I said to Allah, okay, how? Allah says, I give you Ramadan. I give you fasting. I give you Salah. I give you Prophet. I give you Quran. I give you Aql. I give you Hikmah. I've given you fitra. Which of my bounties? Which of my bounties will you be lying for? So let's not use that as an excuse. Inshallah, we'll continue to delve into this in the next few nights on how we can spiritually get closer. And one key operative conversation we're going to have, just be ready for it, is self-purification. This is the most sacred thing in our existence. And it is the most ignored entity in our existence. Self-purification. How do I make myself pure? The biggest problem we have with this simple introduction is we've come to terms with Iblis. We've made a deal with the devil. I don't know for some odd reason, it just seems to be the way. Not that we want to make a deal with the devil, but it's almost like our arms are twisted. Where a little mixture of haram is okay. As long as the majority is halal. That is not purification. I'd like for us to eat, to eat very healthy food with a little poison in it, or a little dirt from the ground, or a little bug floating on it. It's a very healthy dish, but just one bug on it. Take the bug and push it out. I swear you'll have a tough, tough time chewing. Just that little bug that went into your food. But our life is filled with bugs. And we shrug our shoulders. So what? Inshallah. Allah is Ghafur Rahim. He'll forgive us. We need to talk about that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana khfil lana wa liqwanina al-ladhina sabakuna bil-Iman. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghillan al-ladhina amanu. Rabbana inna ka ra'ufur Rahim. Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin karima. Tu'izzu biha al-Islam wa ahla. Wa tu'zillu biha al-Nifaq wa ahla. Wa taj'aluna fiha min al-du'ati la ta'atik wa al-qadati la sadirik. وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته